Well, welcome to Calvary Baptist Church Bible Institute. And <clears throat> we are now going to um, take a look at the overview, or at least have an overview of the New Testament. So um, would you take your, your book, your notebook there, and um, be ready to um, open it up. And we're going to, I'll just have you turn to the page where it says, Brief Overview of the New Testament. And um, there's a biography, history, the Pauline epistles, and so forth at the top. We'll begin there in just a moment. So this is a, an overview. Okay, so this course, this course for our institute is overview of the New Testament. Um, the New Testament, the New Testament, of course, consists of uh, 27 books. And we're going to have a brief overview of them as well. Um, it uh, builds and enlarges on the Old Testament. And uh, primarily the Old Testament is God's dealings with a nation, the nation of Israel, and also the preparation for the coming of Messiah. Um, but when we come into the New Testament, it is, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, the church, and then the consummation of all things. Now, as we look at the New Testament, it is divided into five sections. Okay? Um, you have the first section, which is the Gospels, which is Matthew through John. And then you have a section on history, which is the book of Acts. Um, following that, we have the Pauline epistles, which is Romans through Hebrews. Um, I'm one under the conviction that it was Paul who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, and then we have the general epistles, which is James through Jude. And then a book about prophecy, which is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the New Testament was written from approximately A.D. 50 to approximately A.D. 95. And uh, it ended when uh, the Apostle John died on the Isle of Patmos. The New Testament was written in common Greek called Koine Greek, um, which was the everyday form of the Greek language in the first century AD. Um, just a few things here, and then we'll take a look at this. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give us four different, yet not conflicting accounts of the birth, life, and ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, they demonstrate how Jesus was the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, and they lay the foundation for the teaching of the rest of the New Testament. And um, there were four writers, and each writer saw Jesus in, in a specific way, um, and yet their writings never contradict. In fact, there is a harmony in the Gospels. The book of Acts records the deeds of the apostles, and sometimes I like to refer to the book of Acts as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so it records the deeds of the apostles of Christ, the men who were sent out into the world to proclaim the gospel of salvation. It also tells us the, how the church began to function on the day of Pentecost um, and its rapid growth in the first century AD. It's an incredible book, a book of action, how God worked in that particular period of time. The Pauline epistles uh, written by the Apostle Paul are letters usually written to specific churches and they give official Christian doctrine and the practice that should follow that doctrine. And then we have the general epistles. They complement the Pauline epistles with additional teaching and application um, as it is especially directed to um, God's people. And of course, the book of Revelation prophesies the events that will occur in the end times. So a survey of the New Testament is a powerful and rewarding study. The New Testament tells us of Jesus' death on the cross on our behalf and what our response should be to his death. The New Testament focuses on giving solid Christian teaching along with practical results that should follow that teaching. So. Look with me at where it says, Brief Overview of the New Testament. You see that chart there right at the top of the page. Brief Overview of the New Testament. Um, so so this, this chart, 
if you would, with the columns, where it says biography, history, the Pauline epistles, the general epistles, and prophecies, right? Um, this is something that you can refer back to. So there's, there's as, we, as I give you these fill in the blanks, just kind of, you know, keep this in your mind, referring back, oh yeah, that's right, uh, Colossians, it's one, of, it's one of Paul's epistles. Titus was written by Paul to Titus, that's one of Paul's epistles. Um, first, second, and third John, and notice that it's, it's one of, those are the general epistles, meaning that it's not written in a sense to a specific church, <clears throat> but to believers in general, believers throughout all of time. All right, so let's take a look at this, and I'll give you the fill-in for the blanks here. Number one, the Gospels, okay? How many are there? Four, right? That's your fill-in, four. There's four Gospels. The Gospels were written to tell us about Christ's ministry, his doings and teachings with a special focus on his um, birth and death. And um, we have two genealogical records, one found in Matthew and the other one found in Luke. Um, and uh, we note how much space is devoted to the last week of his life. Now that's especially true in the Gospel of John. When we come to the Gospel of John, beginning in John chapter number 12, um, it deals with the last week in the life of Jesus. And there is so much, there is so much that John records for us there. Okay. Um, the Gospels are divided into two sections. The first section is called the Synoptic Gospels. Now the word synoptic means to see through together. And these include Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they share much of the same material. And the fourth gospel is the gospel of John. So John actually really stands out by itself. So there's, there's four gospels. Okay, why are there so many gospels? Well, there's four. One reason is that the Old Testament law required two or three witnesses to establish a fact um, and it's because each writer has a different audience in mind with different perspectives that require a unique emphasis. And that's an interesting point. So again, the Old Testament law says that two or three witnesses establish a fact. Here God gives four, okay? And each writer writes to a specific audience in mind. All right, so Matthew, letter A. Matthew writes... Um, as a Jew to the Jews, okay, as a Jew to the Jews. And in Matthew, he presents Jesus as the Messiah who fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. And there are various um, Old Testament quotations found in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew uses the phrase, quote, this was to fulfill, okay, or to fulfill, to fulfill. And that's often quoted. That's a key section for the study in the, or, or a key section for the study is the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7, uh, which contains kingdom principles, not only for the future, but for living here and now. And, you know, no greater sermon was ever preached than the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, which shows us how to live right here and right now, okay? And um, Matthew, Matthew writes to the Jews, and to prove to the Jews that Jesus is their Messiah and King. Then you have Mark, letter B. Mark writes um, to the servant-minded Christian. That's your filling, the servant-minded Christian. Now, some of these lines are small, so you're going to have to do your best to fill in that blank. But he writes to the servant-minded Christian. He presents Jesus Christ as the servant of God who demonstrates spiritual power over nature, diseases, and demons, and so forth. It is the shortest yet most active of the Gospels. The key section for study is Jesus warning against religionism in Mark uh, chapter uh, number 7. And there's 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark, and Mark places the emphasis on the works of Christ, um, one of the key words there is the word immediately, or we see straightway. So again, Mark writes to servant-minded Christians. And then there's Luke, okay? Dr. Luke. 
And uh, Luke wrote um, this particular book. And by the way, he also wrote the book of Acts. Okay, he also wrote the book of Acts. Luke writes to Greeks picturing Christ as the full compassion for absolutely everyone, especially the poor and sinful. Then there's John. Okay, uh, he gives a theological portrait of Christ um, in each chapter. It's like there's a specific snapshot of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter number one, he is the word of God. Okay, um, we, we, we see him, you know, it's like you can, you can see him like in John chapter five as the great soul winner, right? Uh, in John chapter six, the bread of life. Uh, John chapter seven, the water of life. John chapter 10, uh, the door. Chapter 14, the way, the truth, and the life. And so there's like these theological portraits, like a snapshot of the Lord Jesus uh, in each chapter of John's writing. Um, so note at the box at the bottom here, at the bottom of your page, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews, the promised Messiah. He writes to the Jews. Mark presents Jesus as the servant of God. That's written to Romans because most Christians in Rome were servants. They were slaves. Luke presents Jesus as the son of man, written for the Greeks. That's the favorite title that Luke uses. And then John presents Jesus as the son of God, and he writes to the entire world. So the Gospels, there are four. Um, Roman numeral number two, the book of Acts. We see that Luke wrote this book as a sequel to his gospel. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter number one. Acts chapter number one. And uh, just look at verses um, one and two. Okay. So he wrote this book as a sequel to his gospel. So Acts chapter one, verses one and two, we read, The former treatise have I made. Well, the, the treatise there means the Gospel of Luke, the former writing, the, the, the treatise, what he had written out. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, that was a title of, of a man, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost gave commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So um, that helps us to understand that Luke was the human writer to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a book of missionary history. It's a phenomenal book. And we see how the Holy Spirit called uh, Barnabas and Saul to the work that he had for them to go on at least three missionary journeys. And um, they, it is the continued acts of Jesus from heaven by the Holy Spirit through his church. And it provides important background for the principal writers of the epistles uh, or the letters of the church is. Number three, Roman numeral number three, the epistles. Now, another word for epistle is letter. And um, most of these letters were written to churches, okay? Um, letter A, Paul's letters, 14, okay? 14 letters that Paul had written. Um, Romans, of course. And there was, there was no... Uh, greater book ever recorded than the book of Romans. It was Paul's masterpiece, if you would, um, written to believers at Rome, setting forth the need for and the plan of salvation in chapters 1 through 11. And Romans can be outlined, like um, uh, chapters 1 through 3, where Paul deals with the subject of sin. Uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6, the subject of salvation, where he deals with justification by faith. Um, chapters 7 and 8, um, sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 form a parenthesis where God deals with his people. God is not finished with the nation of Israel. And then he resumes that in chapters 12 through 16, or he speaks about the behavior and service of the Christian. Um, if you notice right in the middle of Romans that we're looking at here on our page, chapter 13 is a key passage 
for the Christian's relationship to their authorities. Okay, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Okay, so God has given um, man government to help him, and um, and and there is a a relationship that we have to the authorities. And chapter fourteen and fifteen contains some vital principles on how to handle non-essential differences with other believers, such as Christian liberty. Number two, 1 Corinthians, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'll give you the fill-ins, deals with church problems, such as church cliques and divisions. Uh, so there were some definite um, divisions and cliques in the church at Corinth. Some said, I am of Cephas, I am of Paul, I am Christ. So there was division. Paul um, dealt with that. Um, the need for church discipline and so forth. The fill in for the blank there is in chap for chapter 11 was some abuses of the Lord's Supper. So uh, the, the, the Lord's Supper was established by Christ. He gave its institution, but there were some, some abuses of it. Um, wealthier members were... Um, you know, they were getting drunk and they were feasting at the table and some of the poorer members, you know, there was nothing for them. And, and so Paul had to, you know, correct these abuses and show the right approach to the Lord's Supper. Second Corinthians, a defense of Paul's apostleship and his motivation for ministry. Chapter one has some helpful information on comfort and affliction. God is the God of all comfort. Chapter two deals with how... Um, to reassimilate a disciplined church member. Um, chapter 4 deals with how to overcome difficult circumstances that could otherwise lead to depression. Chapter 5 underscores um, being yoked together with unbelievers. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 5 underscores the goal. Excuse me. Chapter 5 underscores the goal and motivation for the Christian life. Chapter 6 Here's your fill-in. Warns against being yoked with unbelievers. It's a doctrine. He teaches there about the doctrine of separation. Okay. Um, chapter 8 and 9 deal with Christian giving. God loveth a cheerful giver. Chapter 12 states the reason for the sign gifts, such as tongues and healing, was to authenticate the apostles and their message. So that was, the, that was the reason for the sign gifts, such as tongues. And tongues is languages, okay? Glossia, languages. And healings, there were healings because God did heal and God can and he does heal. But it was to authenticate the apostles and their message. That they were true apostles and their message did come from God. Then we have the book of Galatians. It combats the problem of the law and asserts Christian freedom through justification by faith alone. Chapter 5 speaks of the struggle in the Christian life, the law of the flesh, and the law of the spirit. And that's something that, that Christians um, do struggle with. And uh, every Christian has two natures, the, you know, the, 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 the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. And... Um, you know, there's sometimes a, a struggle that goes on there. And so Paul deals with that. Chapter 6 opens with a mandate for all Christians to counsel. It's an interesting subject. There's the book of Hebrews, a great, great book. It teaches the superiority of Christ to all that Jewish believers left behind in Judaism. Um, you know, it shows how Jesus is greater uh, than Moses, greater than Aaron, greater than the temple, better than the angels, and that's the key word. Uh, has a great chapter, chapter number 11, on faith. 23 times, 23 times we read by faith, by faith, through faith, and there are various men and women whose faith and their exploits are recorded for us in Hebrews chapter number 11. All right, under under the epistles, Roman numeral B, or letter B, Roman numeral number three. Um, these were letters that were written during Paul's imprisonment. All right, so the first one that's recorded 
uh, you know, in the Bible is Ephesians. Ephesians. It reveals uh, the eternal plan and purpose of God and salvation and how it forms the basis for the believer's walk with God and his fellow Christians. Now, chapter 4 explains the process God uses to perfect believers and then illustrates how it works in solving the problems of communication that tend to divide believers. Well, God has given gifts to the church. Um, let's look quickly in Ephesians chapter number 4. Here's this little teaching principle that we refer to as this is for that. In chapter number 4. In chapter number 4 here. Um, so, verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So I usually put the word this alongside verse number 11 because this is what the Lord has given to the church. The Lord has given this to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why or for that? This in verse 11 is for that in verse number 12. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God has given um, specific gifts. Now the office of apostleship is over, but there are evangelists and pastors and teachers that God has given to the church for the perfecting of the saints. That means to mature them, to mature them in God's word for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, so we, we have that here in Ephesians chapter number four. Um, the word is God uses to perfect believers. That's your fill in. And then at the bottom of this um, chapter five or chapter six under Ephesians covers parent child responsibilities and the Christian work ethic as well as the warfare of God, because we're told to put on the whole armor of God. Or you can put the word armor. That's probably a better word. Okay, yeah, we fight the good fight, but we're also to put on the whole armor of God. So the word would be armor. Put down the word armor of God. Then Philippians. Philippians. Written to assure believers of God's unfailing purpose through Paul's imprisonment. And uh, Paul was in prison at the time, like... You know, he was bound between um, Roman jailers. Chapter 4 covers the kind of thinking that is vital for overcoming victory. Um, in Philippians chapter number 4, remember that the Bible says uh, here in chapter 4, verse number 6, here's the kind of thinking that we ought to have. And here's the practical you know, application to this. Verse number six, chapter four, verse number six says, be careful for nothing, right? In one sense, he's saying, quit worrying. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Notice that word careful in verse number six. It's another word for being anxious. Remember, Jesus said, take no thought, okay? Take no thought, because God's going to supply your every need. And he says, when we think rightly, verse 7 says, the peace of God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So that's Philippians, okay? In chapter 4, it covers the kind of thinking that is vital. Then there's Colossians. Colossians overlaps with much of the content of Philippians. Both deal with the church as Christ's body, but Colossians stresses Christ's role at, as the head of the church. In all things, he is to have the preeminence. <clears throat> um, First Thessalonians, turn the page, please. First Thessalonians, um, great passage on the second coming of Christ and the rapture of believers in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. 2 Thessalonians corrects error regarding Christ's second coming 
Um, there were those who believed that the Lord had already come because a false letter had been written about it. So Paul writes to correct that false teaching. Philemon, Paul's letter in behalf of a runaway con converted slave. There's only one chapter, uh, but it deals with forgiveness. Then there's Paul's letters written to church leaders, Timothy and Titus. We sometimes call these the pastoral epistles. First Timothy gives us important instructions on how to have a healthy church. It covers the role of women in the church. Um, it deals with leadership in the church. It gives us the qualification of leaders. The pastors and deacons are to be men. It tells us, you know, a very, it sets a very high standard um, for those men that God has called. Second Timothy is Paul's final letter. Uh, it contains a great chapter on the inspiration of scripture. Um, and then there's Titus and instructions to Titus on how to organize a new church in a pagan society. And um, he, was, he, was, he was to do that. Then there's some letters from these other men, these general epistles. James covers God's purpose in trials to make his people mature and complete. Then there's 1 Peter. Peter teaches believers how they can expect suffering for Christ but in a way that pleases God. Okay? First Peter was written to believers who were scattered as a result of persecution that came unto Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout Asia, Asia uh, Pontus, Cappadocia, Bithynia, and so forth. And, and Peter writes about their trial of faith and how they were to respond to that. You know, uh, they were suffering, but there was a right way uh, in their suffering to glorify God. Second Peter warns against the infiltration of false prophets that you're filling, false prophets. Peter pulls no punches, okay? He pulls no punches, and he writes about these false prophets and how to identify them. First John um, is a key book on how to have a biblically-based knowledge of salvation. The word is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. It means biblical knowledge. And the word know, K-N-O-W, is the key word um, in that book. But these are written that you, that you might know that you have eternal life. Okay, And that word know um, is found several times in First, uh, in First John to give us a right knowledge of salvation. Second John, number five, is a letter... Uh, of encouragement. It also warns against aiding false teachers. False teachers come, don't bid them Godspeed, don't bid them Godspeed, and certainly don't allow them into your home. And then 3 John is a short work on Christian ministry. We're fellow helpers one of another, fellow helpers to the truth. And then there's Jude. Jude, it, there's only one chapter, 22 verses, warns against false teachers and how to rescue those who have been influenced by them. And then um, there is the book of the Revelation, the book of the Revelation. And it deals primarily with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the final act in God's unfolding drama of redemption. And remember that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, And the word revelation means to unveil. Uh, to go to remove the veil and to see into the future. Um, and it is the last book in the Bible. All right, uh, very quickly, let's look at a brief biography of each author. You see that down there at the bottom of the page. All right, Matthew, it was also known as, who can answer that? Levi, right? Levi. And he was a publican a tax collector who was chosen by Jesus to be one of the 12 apostles. Um, early church tr tradition credits Matthew with the authorship of the gospel bearing his name. And then there's John Mark, okay, John Mark. This disciple is given credit by the church as the author of the gospel bearing his name. Mark was the Latin surname given to this young man whose 
Jewish name was John, so hence John Mark. John Mark was cousin to Barnabas, a prominent figure in the early church. Mark traveled with his cousin Barnabas in ministry and later in years ministered to the apostles Peter and Paul. Then there's Luke. This man is credited with authoring the third gospel and the book of Acts. Um, Luke is mentioned three times in the New Testament, and from these passages, we learn that Luke was a doctor. He was, he was Paul's traveling companion um, on, his, on his missionary journeys, and Paul needed a doctor um, be, because of the many physical problems that Paul had. And um, Luke, as a doctor, was an educated man whose attention to historical detail is of great value to us today. You read the Gospel of Luke and you can kind of get a, a doctor's perspective, for example, of, of the Lord Jesus and how Jesus stood over the body and, you know, like a doctor would look observing for, for the problem so he can fix it. Then there's John, John the son of Zebedee, one of the 12 apostles. John was a fisherman and brother to one of the other 12 apostles, James. The apostle John is the author of the fourth gospel, three epistles and the book of Revelation. So you try to fit that in on your blank there. I know it's tough, but you could just put down Revelation. John was a close personal associate of Jesus, being referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's your fill-in. Then there's Simon Peter. Peter was one of the most prominent of the 12 apostles. And Peter was a fisherman and brother to another of the 12 whose name was Andrew. Peter was also referred to at times as Simeon, along with Cephas and Simon. Peter was part of Jesus' inner circle, that's the fill-in, uh, of disciples and remains an important person throughout early church history. Peter is credited with authoring the two epistles which bear his name and as being the likely source for Mark's gospel. So where would Mark have gotten a lot of his information for that, for his gospel? Evidently from Peter. And then, of course, there's Paul. And although not one of the um, original 12 apostles, was chosen by Jesus to be an apostle and to go out to bring the gospel to the non-Jewish people of his day. So as, um, so as Peter was an apostle to the Jews, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. And he planted churches in Gentile territory. So when, when Paul went out, his ministry was primarily um, to, to them. His background was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee as an unconverted man. And um, he was gloriously converted on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter number 9. Um, James, the author of the epistle of James, um, the man, this man was also a brother of Jesus. James was not one of the 12 apostles, but a leader in the early church at Jerusalem. Um, an important council in Jerusalem chaired by James and responsible for deciding that it was no longer a requirement to keep the ceremonial aspects of the law. That's what we find in Acts chapter number 15, all right, um, that, that uh, God justifies both the Gentiles and the Jews by faith. And then there's Jude, the author of one epistle of only 25 verses, Jude was also half-brother of James and of Jesus. His name in Greek would be Judas. However, this is not the traitor of Jesus, but the defender of the faith, whose epistle speaks out boldly against the apostasy of his day. And on the very bottom of the page, we'll just look at that here. There's an interesting timeline concerning the New Testament, the birth of Jesus. Um... Pentecost, Council at Jerusalem, and between the time of A.D. 49 and A.D. 70, you know, you, you have Matthew, 
Luke and Mark given, the destruction of the temple, which was predicted by Jesus, and then John's writing, okay, and um, then his death, probably around A.D. 95. All right, so that concludes this first lesson. Again, it's a brief overview of the New Testament. Um, next time we'll look at the language of the New Testament and um, some various other, other things. And there's, in our study, you'll have maps of Palestine and the times of Jesus. And then we'll get into a detailed overview of the New Testament books. All right, so um, you can, if you missed something here, you can watch it again and again and, you know, have, have everything. When you're done, when we're done with these studies in our Bible Institute, um, you're going to end up having some, some excellent theological notebooks. And, you know, um, there is a reward for study. And the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, God bless you and thank you for joining us.